How's it going, guys? You guys excited too? You know, I, I feel really honored to be the first speaker. I don't know how that happened, but I am delighted. And I'm also delighted by this incredible, as a designer, I got to say, uh, this is awesome. <laughs> and um, so kudos to uh, the team that did this. And it makes me feel at home because I wear around my neck the koru, which is related to the symbol of regeneration in the Fibonacci series that is found everywhere in the universe, which is really profound. And I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes about the notion of building a movement to build a better world. And it's, you know, my field is architecture and design. And I got to tell you, it's a tough industry to change because development, the way we design our cities and design our buildings, is highly resistant to doing things differently. And I think that that's something uh, that we all have in common. And it can be a lonely thing to be trying to change the way people think about an entire industry, right? And this is an image that I found online, and, and it, it sort of gets you right in the heart. And everyone knows who this is, I hope? Yes, she's in the news quite a bit. And, and her story is really inspiring. It was not that long ago that she was sitting alone by herself on her Friday afternoons protesting the fact that none of the grown-ups around the world seem to be doing enough about climate change. And now, of course, we have this powerful movement that is giving me incredible hope. I hope it's giving you hope as well. Uh, maybe it skipped over a couple generations, but I think the activity that we need, because this planet, as these wonderful young people are, are saying here, needs you to give a shit, right? You guys agree? And so this is what is refueling me as an environmentalist and an activist and a designer is the idea that the next generation is truly showing up and it's powerful. And this is a lesson uh, for those that know me uh, that I learned at an early age as well. I grew up in northern Canada in uh, one of the most polluted places in the world. This is a, the, the formerly the world's tallest smokestack that you can see here. It was the world's uh, largest uh, point source of acid rain for many years. It was designed to be this tall to send the Americans as much pollution as we could and not kill the Canadians. That was pretty much true. Uh, but what it did uh, is it was part of a, a huge mining activity that basically um, acidified the lakes, killed all the fish, killed off all the trees in the region, and it was a moonscape where I grew up. And as a child growing up there, I really became concerned for the way that we develop things. And I knew that it wasn't right that our, our rivers were red. It wasn't right that our lakes were biologically dead. And all of us, I knew as I got older, were complicit in the fact that the, the mines that were there were supplying materials that ended up in all of our buildings and all of our homes and all of our cities and our pots and pans because we mine nickel there. And that nickel is in everything uh, that you use and batteries and stainless steel and this moonscape that you see was my backdrop But when I was little I was invited as the whole community was to regenerate our entire community and for years and years Thousands and thousands of trees were planted eventually won a United Nations commendation and the idea that you could as a as a as a community literally heal landscape that we had destroyed was incredibly powerful and and at, at a young age this is actually me uh, in high school and at a young age I learned that we could be agents of regeneration not just agents of degradation and that inspired everything uh, that I did and saw this transformation appear before my eyes and I recently went back to Sudbury uh, in the summer, and it's a completely different place. So this inspired me to think very differently about my whole career, and I started to do everything I could to learn about sustainable design uh, from the beginning, and it's all that I've been doing. And the, the truth that I want to put forward, which I think that you all fundamentally understand, is this one, that how you do something is what matters. Because we need buildings, we need cities, but how we build them, how we design them, is what matters. We need food. We need clothes. There are things that we use. But how we do it can be fundamentally different 
than the way we've been doing it. We do not need models that we've been, been seeing, whether it's food systems where we're, we're literally killing the world in order to feed people, which is, which is messed up, right? And this is why <laughs> I'm so excited and honored to be here because I believe that this is an important moment to redefine this whole industry that you're a part of and to set the stage for a responsible way, the how, to get it right. That's why I'm here, because what you guys are doing here is powerful stuff. And the work that I do in the architecture field is saying the same thing. We can't build like, I keep thinking the screen's there, the screen's there. <laughs> we can't build like this anymore, right? We can't build buildings and civilization that is mimicking a Blade Runner future that is actually technically impossible to live in, in terms of air quality, in terms of the quality of life as a species we need to, uh, to, to survive with. And I think that we're at an, in, an interesting inflection point right now. And um, 2020, well, certainly we got to get rid of Trump. That's one thing we know we have to do. Um, but, but 2020 is the year of perfect vision, and sometimes life imitates art in that way. And I hope that it becomes a moment in time when we have clarity around all these things that we need to change. And in the architecture world, it is time that we design buildings in the same way, using the same principles that nature uses to design its architecture. The beautiful trees that are behind you, the flowers and plants that surround us, are the kind of architecture that we need to be aspiring to, not the Blade Runner future and not the sort of suburban sprawl model. To build buildings that are truly good, not less bad for the environment, but are truly good, that are free of redless chemicals that can't give you cancer, that use only the sun for all their energy and do not use any fossil fuels, that use only the amount of water that can fall from the sky that we can capture and live within our carrying capacity and our water balance, and that is what we need. And this isn't theory. This isn't utopia. We've been building this shit, and we've been testing it. This is the Bullet Center uh, that is up in Seattle. You're all invited to come see it. Uh, Dennis Hayes, the founder of Earth Day, uh, has his office there. The institute that I created has its office there. This is in sunny Seattle. I'm waiting for the joke to catch on. And it generates more energy from the sun than it, than it uses on an annual basis. It's net positive. It gives energy back into the grid. In the least sunny city in the United States, this was a speculative office building that's cash positive and performs really well. It has composting toilets on all six floors, no need for a sewer connection. We make soil, we don't make sewage. Um, it's completely uh, reliant on rainwater for all the water needs in the building, and, and on and on. I could go over this one for all my time limit, but it's pretty groundbreaking in terms of how it operates. And buildings like the Bullet Center are now sprouting up all over the place. Triple net zero buildings, free of redless chemicals, truly transformative. There's uh, around 600 now uh, in various stages of design, development, construction, or occupation. They're all shapes and sizes. So the Bullet Center was a particular aesthetic. The Tuhoi building in, in New Zealand that I love uh, is another one. This is actually a, a tribal parliament for the Tuhoi, uh, and it was all built around their, their values uh, uh, in terms of how they relate to their land. And the idea that they were going to use the building to, and the, the ideas of the Living Building Challenge to reconnect to culture, to reconnect with place, and it's become this wonderful uh, facility uh, that has a very different footprint uh, on the world. Uh, and there's a whole documentary about this project called Ever the Land that you can Google and find out. And there's nothing more intense than seeing the whole tribe come out for a haka uh, at a living building. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, and uh, is really uh, amazing things. And New Zealand's doing a lot of living buildings now, which is wonderful. And part of the ethos of this is the idea of building from the places that you live in. And these are earth blocks that the, the tribe uh, were making for the construction of the building. And here you can see uh, some of them uh, making these incredible earth blocks that, that went into the building. So very inspiring stuff. My own house, I live only on rainfall. I wanted to show people that you could build a house primarily built with salvaged materials, rammed earth, uh, 
discarded materials uh, and, and make it incredibly beautiful. How do you do this kind of thinking in terms of the materials, in terms of energy? So again, we have composting toilets, we make soil, we're uh, powered only with renewable energy, uh, rammed earth walls, uh, the, the wood for the house came from my site, we milled it on site. Um, and, and again, lots of salvaged items. And the idea when people come there is whether they give a shit about what I'm talking about, they want that. <laughs> they say, I want one of these. Uh, and, and, you know, we want to inspire people. Uh, and here's some of the images inside the house. So you can have an incredibly beautiful but, uh, structure, but with a very different type of impact if you're willing to think this way. And for us, it's been this wonderful experience living in a living building. Uh, my dog likes it a little bit too. She's, you can tell my dog's a little crazy. <laughs> and the ethos here, um, so all the stuff that you see in this image here, there's rammed earth walls, um, all the wood is reclaimed in this image, and that door, that door was brought over, was hand carved with love in Afghanistan, and somebody imported it over to our country, used it for two weeks and threw it in the trash. And it, this sort of culture that we have where people don't value craft and value the substance of material. So I found this thing and I decided to give it the, you know, I put it on a pedestal literally because the door was only this tall and I'm a little taller. And the idea was to say, you know, we need to honor the materials. We need to honor the tree that went into this. And below that, there's a kick plate. Because every day when my children come home, when they bring their friends home, I want them to be reminded that what we need more than anything is to love a lot more, right? So when they come home every day, they're, they're sorry, kids. <laughs> they, have to, they have to see this all the time, and it works. <laughs> and... <laughs> And for me, this is the fundamental question, whether we're talking about the work that you all do, whether we're talking about architecture, or agriculture, somehow we have to decide that we're going to love more than we have been. And not just ourselves, but the wonderful network of species around us that we have forgotten for some reason. And if you spend any time in nature, I have a feeling a lot of you do, you can't help but be in awe, to use the word Jason mentioned earlier, to be in awe of the beauty of life that's around us. And what if our purpose on this planet was to really figure out and develop empathy for everything else that was around us? And I think that the era of homo sapiens, people that think way too damn much about all the wrong things, needs to end and we need to become homo regenesis, the species that heals and stewards the whole planet. So homo regenesis, that's what you all need to be and probably are. <laughs> the guardians of life. And just to bring this to a close, what is homo regenesis? So these are the only slides you have to read. We are, <laughs> we are nature, right? We are an important part of an interconnected system and we ourselves are a system. We recognize that only life regenerates. Our technology doesn't regenerate. Our things don't regenerate. Only life regenerates. We recognize that life requires diversity. And it's diversity that imparts resilience within a system. And we recognize the uniqueness and beauty of all places and all species. And we fall in love with it. Because that's what we need to do to love more. Thank you, everyone.